Hi there and thank you for tuning in. Many people out there argue that there is no secret rapture. They believe that there definitely is a rapture, but it is very public and occurs at the second coming when the angels gather the elect from the four winds. They do not believe in a pre-tribulational rapture of the church. This may sound true on the surface and many people who believe this have very strong conviction on their beliefs. So let's study. The Gospel of Matthew does indeed describe Christ's second coming as a visible public event. It also describes the gathering of the elect from the four winds as being public also. So what's the issue? Why, why are there different views? Let's have a look at Matthew chapter 24 verses 29 through to 31 to start with. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. So this is after the tribulation. No sun, uh, no moon. Or darkened sun and moon no longer giving light. And the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. So at the end of this tribulation it's going to be pretty diabolical. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. This is referencing Christ, Jesus Christ's second coming. Coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. This is most definitely Christ's second coming and definitely occurs at the end of the seven year tribulation. There is definitely a gathering done by angels of the elect of God. It's very public, it's a very visible coming of Christ. It will be a time of mourning for all the tribes of the earth as they realize that Christ is the true Messiah. Everything happens at the second coming. So game over for the secret rapture crowd, right? Before we do that, let's have a look at Matthew 24, 36 through to 42. I've actually got 42 here. But of that day and hour knows no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father in heaven. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what, your, what hour your Lord does come. So obviously no one was really alert. No one was really thinking about or aware that there was going to be a flood coming in Noah's time. So this verse is saying that no one is really going to be alert the same way at Christ's second coming also. When they do see him coming, they're going to mourn. It says the flood waters took them all away in the flood and they died. This is very important when it says a woman will be taken at the grinding mill and the other will be left in the flood to be taken meant that you died it meant death you got taken away in the flood some believe the woman grinding at the mill who is taken is one of the elect being gathered by the angels from the four winds but in context and using the analogy of the flood those who didn't get on the ark were taken and subsequently died so the woman at the grinding mill has likely been taken thrown into the lake of fire you'll see that this is likely for receiving the mark which you'll see later results in instant dismissal to fire and brimstone at christ's second coming there's no questions no discussions taken then cast into the fire that's what happens we can confirm this again because the gathering together of the elect by the angels occurs in verse 31 indicating that the gathering together of the elect occurs before anyone is taken from the grinding mill in verse 41. We know that the flood destroyed everyone on earth. Look at Genesis 6 verse 17 and behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under heaven and everything that is in the earth shall die. To be taken at Christ's second coming also is death. 
Christ's return at the end of the tribulation is a time of judgment. Look at John 5, 27 to 29, and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So graves will be opened. People will be judged according to their works, whether those works be good or bad. Let's have a look at Revelation 1 verse 7. Behold, he comes with clouds and every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. So far we can clearly see that Christ is definitely coming in the clouds. It's going to be public. It's going to be visible. It will not be secret. The angels will gather the elect from the four corners. Some will be taken just like in the flood so they can be judged by their works because they rejected Christ's offer of salvation or took the mark of the beast and end up in the fire. Some will be left so they can enter into life and they'll make up the nations. To be taken in these verses is definitely judgment. It's not good news. Those who are left behind are those who remain to enjoy Christ's millennial reign on earth. Because as he comes, he brings his kingdom down with him. It's very clear. So this must be checkmate for the rapture folk, right? Let's have a look at what Paul says. We go to 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16 to 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Same thing, right? Where is the angels gathering us here? We see in the verse, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. But it doesn't here specify that the angels will be doing the gathering. Why does it say that we will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air? Is this verse here that Paul talks about in Thessalonians contextually the same as what Jesus' description is of his second coming in Matthew and Revelation, making Thessalonians a, an example of the exact same thing? Notice that those caught up or taken in this passage are those who are going to meet the Lord in the air, right? to be with the Lord. Those who are left behind, though, are about to enter the tribulation. Those who are taken are not being taken like in the days of Noah to be judged, what we read in Matthew 24. They are being taken to be with the Lord. So Matthew 24 and Revelation is a very strong focus on God's judgment. 1 Thessalonians 4 is focusing on rescue. Let's have a look at 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 to 53. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. All right, so in our flesh and blood body, we cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be all changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. This passage is very much in harmony with 1 Thessalonians 4. Those in Christ are changed in the blink of an eye. They are then caught up at the last trump to meet the Lord in the air. So at Christ's second coming, as described in Matthew and Revelation, to be taken is very bad news. In Corinthians and Thessalonians, to be taken is actually very good news. Those in Christ are not appointed to wrath. The tribulation is a time of wrath. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 5.9 the tribulation, which will lead to Christ's second coming, is going to be a time of wrath and destruction for those who did not love the truth. If you love the truth and trust Christ's finished work completely for your salvation, you are not appointed to this coming wrath. You will in fact be gathered together to be with the Lord. 
Let's have a look at 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 1 through to 12. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, our gathering together unto him, it's speaking specifically about this, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that day of Christ is at hand. Okay, Let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come. Okay, Except there comes a falling away first and that the man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. So we need to keep an eye open for a falling away, an apostasy, from the truth, a, a dramatic falling away from the truth, and that the man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Notice man of sin has got small letters, no, no capital letters for man of sin. Nothing is emphasized. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember you not that when I was yet with you i told you these things and now you know what withholds that he might be revealed in his time for the mystery of iniquity does already work only he who now lets will let until he be taken out of the way and then shall the wicked be revealed and see we have here a capital letter whom the lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming even him who's coming after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned and believed who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. We know that Christ will return in the clouds at the end of the tribulation. We know that this is Christ's second coming and he is returning in judgment. We know that those who were taken in Matthew 24 are being taken to be thrown into the lake of fire. We know that it is angels who do the gathering of the elect at Christ's second coming, specifically. We know that those in Christ will be changed into incorruptible bodies at the last trump and they will be taken out of the way to meet the Lord in the air, which is called our gathering together unto him. There is angels involved. However, the verse itself only mentions the archangel, the voice of an archangel. It doesn't say that the angels are coming down to actually gather us together. We know that we who trust Christ for our salvation are not appointed to wrath. We know that the rapture, rapture is therefore secret and only something that believers will see in this particular dispensation. We know that the rapture occurs prior to the tribulation because the wicked, with a capital W, cannot be revealed when the Spirit of Christ is here on earth. And the wicked must exist during the tribulation. So that therefore means that the church cannot be here during the tribulation. The true believers are letting, withholding, preventing the full domination of the Antichrist. Paul makes it clear that true believers will recognize the man of sin before he comes to power. And when the man of sin is revealed, we can expect the next event to be our gathering together unto him. And then we will enter into, the world will enter into tribulation. And see, the secret rapture, as they call it, is a scriptural fact. It's not going to be seen like when Christ actually does return coming in the clouds and uses the angels to gather the elect from the four winds, gather Israel from the four winds. But this rapture here occurs prior to the tribulation and is not a publicly visible event. Those in Christ are changed in the blink of an eye. They are then caught up at the last trump to meet the Lord in the air at the end of the dispensation of the grace of God. Colossians 3 verse 4, When Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. So if you wanted to go a little bit deeper here, there's quite a few things that happen concurrently at the last trump, at the close of the dispensation of the grace of God. The first thing that Paul tells us for this dispensation, for it to come to an end, 
is that there's going to be an apostasy, apostasia, a falling away. Some people interpret this falling away as the rapture in itself. Nothing could be further from the truth. The text suggests it is called apostasy, which is undeniable that it refers to a diversion from the truth. Right? People will no longer listen to the truth. They will follow other gospels, and people do. They follow every other gospel other than the gospel of our salvation. Christ's death, burial, and resurrection is payment for our sin. They will not adhere to the truth. They will follow doctrines of demons and endless genealogies. You've got people keeping the Sabbath and saying that that's you know, something that we need to keep. And you have all kinds of people looking for religion, any kind of religious idea where you're going to do something. That's what people want. Christ is not about you doing anything. It is about his faith. It's about the faith of Christ. It's about his finished work on the cross as payment for our sin. Yeah. They will fill themselves up with all the knowledge, but never will they come to the knowledge of the truth, which is the simplicity of Christ. The simplicity of Christ. Even babies can understand. This works perfectly because with non-existent church, you've got to remember, if the church isn't preaching the gospel, if the church isn't preaching the truth, as 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4, if they aren't preaching that gospel in every single opportunity that they get, right, then it's, it's a non-existent church. It's not a church. It might have a building there and it might look like one, but it's not. And what does that do? That creates an excellent environment for the man of sin to come on the scene. Because the church has no power. It's losing its power because there's just no gospel in there. There's no truth in there. There's no substance. If there's no gospel, there's no word. If there's no word, there's no spirit. Sure enough, the next thing to watch for, according to the Apostle Paul, is the man of sin is going to be revealed. He isn't going to be revealed with full power at the beginning, but we will be able to identify him as the church, the body of Christ. The man worships himself. He sees himself as God. He's very powerful, very influential. He has the ability to end wars, to make peace, to solve the world's financial problems. He's going to deny God, but he's definitely going to deceive people. He will convince them that he is a Christian because the so-called Christians don't know the truth because they don't read their Bibles. And if they do read their Bibles, they're likely reading a modernized Zondervan publishing version. He will say he is the Messiah. He will say he is the chosen one. He will make peace in modern Israel, which would please a lot of Christians. He will build a temple in modern Israel. He will introduce a mark via his false prophet. When this man's revealed, the trump sounds shortly after the dispensation of grace concludes and the church is then raptured. Then the wicked, with a capital W, is revealed. The Antichrist now, full power. The light has been removed. Now the world enters a terrible time of darkness. Evil and darkness works in two speeds, two gears. The first half of the tribulation's quite bad. But the second half is called the Great Tribulation. Jesus refers to it as the Great Tribulation. And it's beyond anything that we could even imagine or something that we could even create in Hollywood. I don't think we could do it. Now, very interestingly, at this same time, at the beginning of the Tribulation, after the church has been raptured, Ezekiel 37 will be fulfilled. Ezekiel 37 is a very literal prophecy of Israel. That's who... Matthew 24, that's who Jesus is referring to in Matthew 24, the elect, okay? When the elect get gathered from the four winds, this is revised, revived born-again Israel at the end of the tribulation. That's what that's referring to. It's not referring to uh, the taking away or the rapture of the body of Christ who are saved by grace through faith alone. You'll see why. The, the, if you... If you stick with me here, you'll see clearly why. Let's have a look at the Valley of the Dry Bones in Ezekiel 37. I've done quite a few videos on this. So if you haven't seen them, have a look on my channel about Israel and you'll understand the Valley of the Dry Bones. It is all of dead Israel. All those who were bloodline descendants of Jacob, who were blinded for our salvation and they subsequently suffered death and destruction as a result of their rejection of their Messiah. Christ came for his people. He came for Israel and they rejected him. 
And Paul tells us very clearly, don't be conceited in the way you think about Israel because yes, they were cut off because of unbelief. Don't get too smart because you can be cut off just as quickly. If he can cut off his own branches, how much easier it is to cut the branches off of the wild olive tree we were grafted in, okay? So they've suffered. They've suffered throughout history because of their rebellion, because they never listened to God all the way through the Old Testament. But this happened for our salvation, okay? So, so we, we could have salvation. Once the dispensation of the grace of God comes to an end and Christ removes the true believers from the earth, then he begins to pick up and deal with Israel again, just as he promised he would. And that's what Ezekiel 37 is, the valley of the dry bones. The bloodline descendants of Jacob, blinded for our salvation. Okay, if the, their, their blindness allowed salvation to come to the Gentiles. And yes, they lost their temple. Their whole city was destroyed. 1.1 million Jews killed in Jerusalem in 70 AD. It was an absolute disaster. Passover time. Everyone from all nations, all the Jews from all nations were there at the temple and not one stone was left untold, unturned, just as Jesus said when he was talking in Matthew 24. And what happens uh, when Israel are actually risen from the graves? Quite literally, God puts his spirit in them. They are born again. Jesus was talking to Nicodemus and he, Nicodemus asks what it is to be born again and Jesus explains. You cannot see the kingdom of God unless you are born again. You have to die once and be born again. They've died. Israel has died. They are now in the graves. And shortly, when we get raptured, when the tribulation begins, Israel will be raised. God will put his spirit in them and they will be his people and they will go into the tribulation. At the end of that tribulation will be the fulfillment of Jeremiah 31, 31. And Israel will be given their new covenant. This was promised to them. The Bible calls this tribulation period the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob is Israel. It occurs at the end of the dispensation of the grace of God or the fullness of the Gentiles. These people that believe that the church has just replaced Israel, Israel rejected Christ, that's it, they're finished, they're done, there's nothing more, we're now Israel, they've totally missed the point. They've 100% missed the point. Yes, we are grafted into the vine. Yes, we are uh, able to be partakers of the covenants and blessings but we are not a covenant people we are the gentiles who were saved by grace through faith alone in order to provoke israel to jealousy this is why paul says that after the rapture at the end of the dispensation of grace and so all israel shall be saved okay we are not israel once we are removed once the dispensation of grace completes Israel shall be saved and that they certainly will be I'm not talking about modern Israel Palestine I'm not talking about that I'm not talking about people who say that they're Jews no they're just Gentiles just like anyone else they have to come to Christ the same way that we do All right Israel are resurrected but they are resurrected to earth and will await the return of Christ when he will bring his kingdom down from heaven to earth and set it up for his millennial reign so they get re resurrected. They live on earth during the period of tribulation. At the end of the tribulation, the angels gather them together from the four winds, take them up and then bring them back down again so that they can set up the kingdom for the millennial reign, which is going to be ruled under Christ's rule. When the dead in Christ are resurrected at the rapture, they are gathered to meet the Lord in the air. They are not resurrected to stay on earth those in christ who were alive at the sound of the last trump are also raptured up to meet the lord in the air at the end of the tribulation and in the millennial kingdom israel will sit on the 12 thrones as there are 12 tribes of israel and there always has been since jacob became israel and christ will be king the church is very distinct from israel 
The church is known as the body of Christ. It has its position in heavenly places and it will remain that way. We are nonetheless both Israel and the body of Christ. We are nonetheless one body, all united in Christ. However, God's promise to Israel is eternal. His promise to us is also eternal. One is physical and earthly and the other one is heavenly. His covenants are strictly with Israel. We are partakers of the covenants and blessings, but we are not a covenant people. During the tribulation, as Israel wander the earth, they will witness a group of Gentiles calling the land there Israel, at Jerusalem. They will see the Antichrist constructing and ruling from his temple at some point, setting up an abomination of desolation after three and a half years. They will see him set this up. And Jesus tells them, if you are in Judea when you see this, flee to the mountains. Because there's going to be great tribulation for that last three and a half years once the Antichrist sets up his abominational desolation. And they will complete Israel. They will complete the great commission that Jesus commanded them to take the gospel of the kingdom to the ends of the earth. Not the gospel of the grace of God. All right, Jesus didn't preach the dispensation of grace. He didn't preach the gospel of the grace of God. That was taught by Paul, who learnt that from Jesus later. After Jesus' ascension, Jesus separated Paul to the gospel of the grace of God for us Gentiles so that we could be saved. Right? This is a dispensation that we're living in, whether you like it or not. A lot of people think that dispensationalism is a heresy. It is truth. Dispensation the dispensation of grace by this time at the, during the tribulation is now complete. So what comes next after that? Well, the kingdom is coming. The kingdom is coming next. As Israel preach on earth during the tribulation, a great multitude will be saved. These people who do get saved are not saved by grace through faith alone. You can't be. Sure, Salvation has always been by grace and it always will be by grace because we never have been and we never will be good enough as of ourselves on our own. But in order to get salvation during that tribulation time, endurance to the end, loss of life, strength in times of extreme persecution, threats of death, all right, you've got to hold steadfast. You can't deny Christ because it's absolutely essential. One, one during the tribulation must not under any circumstances take the mark of the beast. There's no amount of grace available that will cover this grave choice. The scripture is very clear. If you take the mark of the beast, you are confirmed. You have imprinted on your hand or in your forehead that you openly and commit to rejecting Christ and supporting the Antichrist. You reject the Holy Spirit. You blaspheme the Holy Spirit. You spit in Christ's face when you get that mark. Okay, And that renders you finished, completely dead, straight to the lake of fire the moment Christ returns. For now, no problem. He's not doing anything. He's not judging you now. Now is the time for salvation. He's got his hand open, outstretched, offering salvation to everybody. The church isn't really teaching it properly the way it's supposed to be. And that's why I'm doing these videos, right? But salvation is available now. If we miss it, it's going to be hell in future. And don't think you're so strong and faithful that you'll be able to, no problem, I'll just cruise through the, uh, I'll just cruise through the mark of the beast and I won't get it. Don't be so sure. In order to get salvation during this time, endurance to the end, loss of life, strength in times of persecution and threats of death are essential. One must not, under any circumstances, take the mark of the beast. See, the thing is with the mark of the beast is you might not be able to live, eat, work, operate in society without it. So you're going to have to choose uh, what you want to do there. You're going to either lose your life so that you can gain it, or you're gonna try and keep your life and you're going to lose it. It's exactly what Jesus said. Do you really wanna to have to make that choice? Do you really think that you're willing to lose your life? Did you take that uh, 
thing recently to keep your job maybe to put food on the table what about when the antichrist introduces the mark if you're still here during that tribulation time what are you going to do then why not just come to the knowledge of the truth now and accept christ's finished work and his offer of salvation for free right now accept the simplicity of christ you don't need a degree you don't need a college degree you don't need a, a, a uh, to go and study in a Baptist seminary or any of that rubbish. It's all rubbish. The scripture is clear. Why not have a real good think about it? Don't be one of the multitude who have to get saved during the tribulation because there's going to be a lot of people that do get saved during that tribulation. It says a great multitude will be saved. But it's going to be very, very hard for them. It might result in you being murdered, killed, losing your house, losing your car, losing your job, losing your life, everything. You don't need to do that if you put your trust in Christ. Because he said that you are not appointed to wrath. The time for salvation is now. So after all of this, what's the next thing? What happens next? Well, the next thing after the tribulation is Matthew 24, the return of Christ. He's coming in the clouds to first step on the Mount of Olives and destroy the Antichrist with simply his breath to return with his church, which is his body, to judge the quick and the dead. Will the multitude who believe during the tribulation be judged? Yes. Well, what, will they, what are they going to be judged according to? Will they be according to their works? Did they resist the mark of the beast? Did they lose their lives because they realized that Jesus truly is the true God and they did not submit to the Antichrist? Jesus will then determine their fate. What about those who took the mark? Matthew 24 explains they will simply be taken and Revelation confirms. They will be immediately thrown into the lake of fire to face torment with fire and brimstone for eternity at the minute Christ returns. What about those who died throughout history and never heard of Jesus or the gospel of our salvation? They will be raised as well and they will also be judged according to what? According to their knowledge, according to their works and according to their heart. God understands that many people on earth never had the opportunity to hear the gospel and his judgment on those people takes that fact into consideration. Right? By the time, by the end of the tribulation, everyone is going to have heard the gospel of the kingdom because Israel's job is to get that out there. A lot of people think that that's our job to go and take the gospel of the kingdom to the ends of the earth. No, that's, 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 not, that's not the job of um, Christians in the dispensation of the grace of God. Our job is to take the gospel of the grace of God to as many people as will hear it. Christ's death, burial and resurrection is payment for our sin. God searches everyone's hearts. He knows the deep thoughts we have. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He can discern and his judgment is appropriate and just and righteous. And what about those who openly rejected the gospel while on earth and denied it until the death? You might have had a family member that was like that and they died and you might wonder about it and worry. Well, the answer is that they are going to be raised at Christ's return at the end of the second coming. They're going to be raised out of the graves and they're going to be judged. And what are they going to be judged according to? Well, they're going to be judged according to their works. Once again, God understands how different things that happen in our lives can lead us down terrible paths. It makes people bitter and angry and they don't like God because of maybe what something happened to them when they were young or a lot of people got abused in churches and all that sort of stuff and assaulted. And people unfortunately turn that back onto the church and think that that's God. So they therefore hate God. I'm pretty sure God understands that. You know, he, he's looking at the heart of the person. He's looking at whether the person is repentant, whether that person recognizes and accepts the fact that they're a sinner and says, yes, thank you, Lord. I'm, I thank you for dying on the cross and paying for my sins because I couldn't do it myself. I'm sorry I stand guilty in front of you, but thank you for what you did. If you've got that attitude in front of Christ, you're one of his. If you don't, have that kind of attitude and you want to say no I'm fine I'm good I haven't done anything wrong I've been a good person all my life I never hurt anyone I never did anything I don't need God if you want to think that way you know where you're going okay you probably won't be watching this video if that's how you think but nevertheless Christ's hand remains outstretched for a time to come I'm not sure when he's going to return um, to gather his church 
first and then start the tribulation, but it should be any, any week, any day, any month, any year. I don't know. It's going to be soon. Ultimately, the judgment of all people on earth through history who have died will either be resurrected to life or resurrected to damnation. Those who took the mark are not judged. They are thrown into the lake of fire. The taken, thrown into the fire. Those who trusted Christ during the dispensation of grace, which is now, already have eternal life. It's already assured, guaranteed, been sealed the moment you believe the gospel. We will sit before the judgment seat of Christ, no doubt. We will be refined with fire. It's going to melt away all of the dross and the bad stuff. But this is not the judgment of the quick and the dead at the second coming of Christ. Israel's kingdom will then be established on earth. Okay, Christ will be the king and rule the nations with a rod of iron. Christ's kingdom comes down from above. In Revelation, John measured the temple of what is coming down. The old serpent is chained and thrown into the bottomless pit for the 1,000 year reign and there is relative peace on earth for that time. So who makes up the nations in Revelations? It says that there's going to be the nations and they are those people who were judged before God and they received life. These are people whom God has discerned their hearts and found them worthy of life. This is made up of people who didn't hear the gospel or were misled to believe a false gospel through no fault of their own. Perhaps they didn't have access to the Bible. It will be made up of people during the tribulation who saw the truth, who realized, were saved and then refused to take the mark of the beast because they knew the consequences of doing that. In God's plan, right, there are very, very clear realms. There are levels, there are systems, there's administrations, which we call dispensations. That's how God works. It doesn't mean that God changes, he can change his mind, anything like that. But God has clearly acted dispensationally the way he, the way he deals with us in humanity. So there's a lot of confusion when it comes to all this prophecy stuff. Um, I've done another video on Daniel's 70 weeks. That might be worth listening to if you found this useful, um, just so that you can understand how that prophecy works in light of an understanding of what Israel is and what the church is. hope I've uh, made it as clear as I possibly can. If you thought it was a good video, please give it a like. If you've got any thoughts, feel free to share them in the comments. Maybe subscribe to the channel and I'll try and put some videos on as often as I can. Thanks very much for watching. Have a great day.